Good afternoon. We are so thrilled, Dan Jurgen and myself, Your Royal Highness, to be moderating you on this session on the new energy economy. We are going to be splitting moderating duties this afternoon, um, but we thought we would open with a, a question on the current energy landscape and energy crisis. As, as you think about this moment that we're in right now in terms of the war in Ukraine, in terms of fears of shortages globally, how are you thinking about Saudi Arabia and how are you thinking about this energy challenge? Well, first of all, I want to start that we, I don't want to be short of being uh, gracious amongst all the Saudis, both women and men of being gracious hosts. And I would like to welcome everybody for our FII. <laughs> and there is also a Saudi particularity uh, that when we speak to people, we don't give them our back. So I want to apologize for those who are behind me. It seems to be the organizer should have put some seats with the rotating seats. This way, we would appear eg egalitarians <laughs> with our friends. Uh, we are in a critical uh, time, a critical point. I'm still mesmerized with the idea that people can have a single doubt and that Saudi Arabia, the country, with its history of uh, carrying the motto and delivering that motto over the last 35 years. Dan and I, unfortunately, we go back 36 years ago, uh, which is an admission that I should not say, but it's that reality. We have coined that uh, to, la, logo, Saudi Arabia is the most secure, reliable, and dependable supplier of oil. Show us when we did we ever forfeit our responsibility, did not deliver our, to, our, to everybody's expectations. So we look at this situation with a great deal of sense of responsibility. We have a duty to fulfill because we have a record that we would like to maintain. In giving the situation today, and Dan would probably validate that, I have not seen yet any circumstances, any energy crisis that has evolved in such a way, with such a diversity, from different, different inputs, with different trajectories, and they all could convolute in what we could call it the worst energy crisis that the world might attend to, with the exception, of course, of what we underwent uh, during COVID. Or it could be the most diverse, complex situation or prelude of a, a crisis that we need to congregate in trying to find solution. That solution is not going to come from one country. It's not going to come from one source. It's going to come from a diversity of solutions with serious attendance. But more important, a state of avoiding that state of denial that we have a crisis and then and not to continue which, with what, what I call it kicking the can policies that are actually delivering more accumulation of complications. Well, let me, let me jump in then uh, as you talk about energy crises and with another question. The people, some people think the energy crisis started on February 24th when Russia invaded Ukraine, but of course it started really more than a year ago when the markets became very tight because of underinvestment, lack of tight supply, strong economic growth, and uh, so it's been going on for it was six months before the war started. But now we're looking at a situation come December 5th when the European ban uh, on import of Russian oil goes into effect. 
And uh, Your Excellency, I want to ask you, how is Saudi Arabia preparing? What's your dialogue with Europe right now to uh, assure that Europe doesn't run short of oil because it can't import Russian oil? Very simple, business as usual. We have a very capable company. Even that company has a very capable trading firm. It's Saudi Aramco and, and Aramco Trading. We've been approaching our friends in Europe um, just to make sure, although Aramco is capable in its own to do all of the work, but we wanted to for the purpose of emphasizing how uh, serious uh, we are as, as a government in trying to be attentive to the situation and working with European governments just to make sure that if there is any type of facilitations that are required. Uh, we are engaged with so many governments and I can name few and you could check what we are doing with them. Just to give you an example, Germany, Poland, the Czech Republic, Croatia, Romania and others. Uh, <clears throat> they're going through a phase of de-bottlenecking uh, their uh, uh, supply chains and supply systems to ensure that we can come in. Uh, I have to, I can share with you a number with our good audience and whoever is hearing me. Back in September last year, Saudi Aramco was supplying Europe with, with 490,000 barrels. This September, Saudi Aramco was supplying Europe with 950,000. Uh, where we would be in the next few months, we will be the same. We will be the supplier of those who want us to supply them with. Your Royal Highness, could I ask you about the spare capacity issue in the context of the most recent OPEC meeting? That meeting generated you know, some controversy in Washington, but how do you think about that decision in the context of building back spare capacity? And how do you see your role using that capacity? Because there have been previous moments, the Gulf War, where Saudi Arabia significantly ramped up production. When Libya went out in 2011, Saudi Arabia increased by a million barrels. You helped backfill the United States when we had Hurricane Katrina. How are you thinking about building back spare capacity? As, uh, as a historian here, he will tell you how the Gulf War was won. If it wasn't for Saudi Arabia, excess capacity. During the occupation of Kuwait, and I don't want to spend so much time on history, because I think what is important in this event is focus on our future. And this is one of the things that is uh, probably, I would call it frustrating us as Saudis. Because, you know, we made a pledge ourselves to focus more on our future. A deliberate future that we have put together a plan for. It's called Vision 2030. And it really disturbs us to see us, our focus, divert from attending to the vision. But just to go back to your uh, uh, question. The reason that the world, uh, the occupation of Kuwait happened is because we had a third, 3 million barrels, 3.2 million barrels was produced extra from Saudi Arabia to mitigate the uh, total summation of what we lost because of the occupation from Iraq and Kuwait. When the situation evolved in Libya, for example, we use that excess capacity in the form of about 1 million, which is almost 70 or 80 percent of what Libya was producing. Could anybody tell me in this audience or any other audience who could have delivered, and many other incidents such as Katrina and what have you, who could have saved the world economy if it wasn't for that excess capacity? And why it is argued now that if we feel, which is purely economical, and Dan was telling me a while ago that he was attending the IMF, and people talked about imminent recession. In fact, the IMF was warning the world as the, the, the worst is yet to come. If we see 
uh, everybody is talking about recession. And it's not just about recession, it's about how severe the recession might be. If we talk about the uncertainties and layers and layers of uncertainties about, about what will happen to China, zero COVID policy. And by the way, just two days ago, it was reconfirmed that China will continue with its own policy, which means that what the much talked about potential growth is probably will be still in waiting to happen. If we talk about the uncertainties that are being generated about uh, sanctions, about cabs and what have you, because we really don't know how it would play. We don't know and we don't have a, I don't have a, uh, you know, a magical thing to, to tell me what a country A or a country Z would do as a result of the uh, kickstart of these things. So in a way, we do have an uncertainty that will come with some gloomier pictures of what this next year will be, what would be the best solution is to mitigate. I still would like to have an audience, this audience or other, and I'm willing to offering to go in a public debate with the who is who about which is more important, being attentive, preemptive, and uh, engaged including taking measures ahead of time to prepare you for what might be the worst yet to come, or you forfeit that opportunity, and when you forfeit that opportunity, you lose time, you lose chances, and what we have learned as a tough lesson that can never be repeated, in 2008, we let it go, and look at how much time it took us to bring about the correcting measures. Why should we go far to, as far as to, to, to 2008, 2020? Had we taken the measures that we as Saudi Arabia called for in March, good chunk of the damage that happened to the markets would not have happened. And a corrective measures that would have been started earlier could help us, help us to mitigate much earlier. So, so uh, Your Excellency, you mentioned 2020, and of course, that was a time in which the U.S. and Saudi Arabia very much cooperated to stabilize the market. Uh, as you mentioned, I was at the IMF meetings and was quite struck by the general uh, pessimism about the world economy, and obviously that was reflected in, in the OPEC Plus decision. But uh, I live in Washington, and as you know, uh, Washington is looking through two lenses. One, the war in Ukraine, and two, inflation, uh, and has obviously had a different perspective on that. But now we're looking at December 5th, we're looking at the uncertainties that come after that. How to, how to get that relationship and an energy relationship back on track? Well, uh, I, I think... Uh We've, we, as Saudi Arabia, decided to be the maturer guys and let the dice fall. And <laughs> what I utter sometimes, not because of me, because of whom I represent, makes a difference. So I usually, as you always hear me, I'm not terribly vocal and I use a, a low tone. And I'm quite picky and choosy about the words I use. Because I know for certain that when the tough gets going, or the, when the going gets, the the going going gets, gets tough, tough, the tough, tough get going. gets going. So I'm, I'm keeping that chance for a proper uh, panoramic exec uh, execution for how Saudi Arabia can fulfill its own promises. Right. But I guess given, you know, as you, as you pointed out, the risk and uncertainties, it is important to restore a good dialogue to manage the situation. I believe, and again, it's a debatable issue. I cannot claim uh, that it is one-way street, but it's debatable. From my personal experience, I hope you can share your own experience, uh, 
Sudan, there is nothing better than upholding your wherewithals for the very time that you need to use it the most. If we, re we, we did the retention of capacity and we have lodged it back as excess capacity, right. it pays off. If you look and you talk to even people that are market experts, there is a gulf of difference that the world has X percentage of excess capacity than a lesser capacity available at time cri of crisis, which are, as you have been right. saying, could be imminent. Right. And Can you imagine that this so-called potential of a more severe crisis happens when the world has less capacity? And I would have to say also less emergency stocks. People are depleting their emergency stocks. Yes had depleted it, used it as a mechanism to uh, manipulate markets, while it is profound purpose was to mitigate shortages of supply, be it as it may, it's everybody's choice. However, however, it is my profound duty to make it clear to the world that losing emergency stock may become painful in the months to come. Right. Well, I think Halima and I were talking before this session, and Halima, you were pointing out that actually no one knows how things are going to play out in December, yes. and that obviously emphasizes the importance. I know. I mean, there's, there's so much uncertainty in terms of the sanctions, in terms of the price caps. If you think out on this market, you know, what is your biggest source of near-term anxiety as you look out over the next... You know, Luckily, I don't suffer from any type of anxieties. Uh, yeah. He's a very calm person. Yes. If I suffer from any anxiety, I wouldn't be in this seat. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> your Excellency, no one wants you to have yes, anxiety. No one does. <laughs> But actually, that pivot, we are headed into... Copy. There are people that sometimes cause me, call me as, oh, we don't understand him. He's a very cold-blooded fellow. Yeah. I have to maintain my sanities. Yeah. I represent the country yeah. that is calling energy is its home. Yeah. I cannot but conduct myself without being conscious of the aura of this country, of the image of this country, of the legitimate seat that this country had earned. And if we don't conduct ourselves in such a way, we lose the narrative. You remember in February 2020? Yes. Can you please recite to our od good audience here and those who are willing to watch us and hear us properly. Well, since it's now, we can talk about that meeting. It was previously off the record, but a Bloomberg reporter broke the story that you were talking about. It was in February. We had the early reports of COVID-19 cases, and you were pushing for a significant production cut. And I remember you said to all of us in the room that when your house is on fire, you call the fire department and you get the biggest hose. You may lose your furniture, but you save your house. Absolutely. And I'm still with that simplistic, simple-minded uh, example. I will tell you it's the same because there is a difference between taking a preemptive action, a proactive action, uh, in which way, way you will be able to attend to this situation as they may prevail in a much better way. In 2020, it was the embers. Because if we had that, as I described it a while ago, if we had, in, he, in this situation, we have the opposite direction. But it, it, it's it, the same tools of, in the same kit is still applicable. You need to make sure that you build a situation where if things goes to the worst, 
you have the ability to come forth. And let's not forget, in 2008, demand was going up and up and up, or at least it looked as if it is going up and up. And so we kept producing as Saudi Arabia, which is a tough lesson that we learned. We kept producing, and for those who followed that year from the energy uh, community, they would know that the more we produced at Saudi Arabia, the more prices got higher and higher and higher. And the reason for that was everybody in this world was saying we're running out of capacity. Again, I would say it and ask the experts. Running out of capacity has a much dearer cost than what people can imagine. It is not a summation issue. It is a psychological issue. The market will be driven by a different parameters once we get rid of excess capacity. Would people like us to give it a trial? I cannot try it because we've been through it three times. We may try it maybe in the next few months when we have what everybody is concerned about. Can we mitigate all of the problem? No, because it all depends on, and again, how much oil we will be lost, if we are gonna be lo losing oil. But I have to confess that talking about uh, caps and floors, and by the way, it's very funny. Uh, what we know, it's not in the public domain, but we hear it, is that it's a very funny phenomena. The, the floor is probably gonna be higher than the cap. Hello, I don't understand it, but this is the reality of today. <laughs> Should we turn to transition? Yeah, could we, could we pivot, Your Highness, to a, another topic? We are headed into COP27 in Egypt. Mm -hmm. Many of us who have known you for years, we often come to see you at the Saudi Energy Efficiency Center. You are the father of energy efficiency in this country. As we think about COP27, can you walk us through the initiatives that you are most excited about in terms of transition? We're extremely excited uh, that first the host is Egypt because what brings us together with Egypt. But the excitement is even being doubled because in COP27, we're talking about implementation. And that's why the His Royal Highness the Crown Prince decided to move the Green Initiative and the Middle East Initiative to Sharm el-Sheikh. And you know why? Because we have a lot to showcase. Because of its implementation nature, we have lots of things to showcase that we are in the implementation phase and we would like to show what we have implemented and we would like to show what we will be implementing and there will be quite a few surprising uh, events. We'll keep it to ourselves. After all, we have to have the element of surprise. That's Are we going to give us a little hint? Huh? Yes. A little Teaser? hint? No, no, no. A trailer? Uh, no, no, no. We, 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 we keep it as, uh, as we've learned from uh, TV series. We have to keep the audience engaged, otherwise... Uh, <laughs> can you imagine watching The Sopranos knowing what would be the second right. episode? I wondered which movie or television show you were going to mention. Or, or, or for that matter, Game of Thrones. Right. <laughs> Not your description what of the comes oil to market, my mind I now is the, huh? <laughs> Not your description. I hope it's not your description no, 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 of the we, oil you market. Know, we, you know, we, we, we should, we owe it our, actually, we owe it also to our friends in Egypt. Right. We are, we're partners with them in making that cup uh, uh, succeed and succeed resoundingly, uh, as also we are fortunate that COP28 will be hosted by the UAE and, and we'll, we'll keep them coming. Right. What we want to make sure of is that we will demonstrate to the people, Amin is giggling now, <laughs> keep it to yourself, Amin, 
we really put our money where our mouths are. Now, we want to show also, we want others to show us where is their money and where are their mouths. So, uh, I guess we have a couple more minutes. I think we have. Um, do you want to say, I know you want to ask a question about the ministry, but maybe just, uh, and I don't know if this is one of the secrets you want to keep, but just one of the, when I was at the ministry and saw the things you're working on, obviously hydrogen was one of them. Do you want to say anything about just where your thinking is on hydrogen now? Uh, yeah, and this is again what I alluded uh, about in the beginning. You know, all of what we have, we're going through the fiasco, if I could call it, that we're going through, is, a, is a, a real cause of frustration, or not of me, for me, but for our entire ecosystem, uh, as a ministry, as companies, as regulators, as all of the above. Again, we want to focus back uh, our challenge today is how we can maintain our focus in delivering the Vision 23, uh, 2030. I hope I would not, I haven't seek, seek his pardon, but I will seek his pardon in public, uh, that I would say a few words about Vision 23. And I hope I would be forgiven for what I will say. Vision 23 is no longer the vision of the Crown Prince. Vision 23 is the vision of all Saudis. The amount of women and men, the thousands of women and men, proudly repeating it, the thousands of women and men that are working and delivering that vision is astounding. We owe it to them that we make it, and we owe it to everybody who would benefit from it, that we stay on the same track. Right. The rest, to us is nuance. Right. Yeah. I have to be, and that's why we are also guided with nothing different than what a, a responsible government would do. You know, I keep listening, are we with us or against us? Is there any room for, we are for Saudi Arabia and for the people of Saudi Arabia? Is it bad? Is it wrongdoing? Is it being impolite? I will be the most impolite public speaker if I say I am not for pro-Saudi. And we will have to deliver our ambitions. Right. Well, thank you. I think in the time we have, you have one I, last question I, that flows directly from what you've just, just said. Yes. So, Your Royal Highness, equality is one of the themes of this year's summit, and I have known you for years, and I remember going to the ministry, I think, 16 years ago, and you let me tell this story, so <laughs> I will blame this on you if anyone gets mad at me, but I remember going to the ministry, and there was no women's room for me to use at the ministry, and I was pregnant, and I had to use your, you know, your bathroom, and the difference now, when I go to the but ministry... But I made you use my bathroom, so I just in case, you know. <laughs> <laughs> This is very... Yes. I left, I left yes. the office and I said, you can have the bathroom. You, you let me tell the story, because when I go to the ministry now... And I checked it with my wife, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> we we pre-cleared this For question. For the purpose of transparency. <laughs> but it, it speaks to when you go to the ministry now. I could not have envisioned, when I met you 16 years ago, the profound change I would see in this ministry. I mean, it was older, it was male. And when I go to the ministry now, it looks like a tech firm. I feel like if you're over 35, you know, you're in the distinct minority. And women occupy some of the most important positions in your ministry. You have built an incredible pipeline of female talent. And so my question to you, Your Royal Highness, is if we are at FII, you know, number 16, will we potentially be sitting on the stage with Her Excellency, the Minister of Energy from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia? This, if I, if I <laughs> ask, what, six? 
10 so years from 10 now. 10 years from now, 15 years from now. So, so why, why 16? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Helema, you, you visited us, Dan, you visited us. I would invite everybody to come and visit us. And by the way, we, we at the ministry, we don't go for equality, and we don't go for affirmative action. We have transcended those, all of these things. We go for meritocracy, merits governance. So when we recruit, when we recruit ourselves, we don't care. We care about the talent that we are recruiting. But I'll give you an example of what yet to come, more to come in Saudi Arabia. A uh, few days ago, I made a public announcement. It's good that our friends here share it. Share it. A university that myself, I mean, quite a few of the audience here, had graduated from, uh, it's called KFUPM in Dara. Even a, a, a female kitten would not go through that gate. <laughs> it's as bad as this, you know, sorry. <laughs> not a female kitten would go around that vicinity, you know, even a mile away. Through the introduced graduate program, uh, four years ago or so, but it was quite a, f a small number of, you know, they would come at night, and leave at night. It's like, you know, a clandestine activity, you know, to be educated was like almost a clandestine activity. What we did is we admitted last year uh, four uh, undergraduate uh, girls to be, uh, to be uh, admitted. And we get away with a 20% admission. <laughs> Here comes Johnny, wait. <laughs> this year, we admitted actually 40%. And if it wasn't for uh, a dormitory issue, which Aramco will, hope, will hopefully will finance one of these as a good, good gesture of goodwill, uh, I will give you a statistic. In their evaluation uh, sheets, the cutoff point in the overall evaluation sheet was, sheet was and by, by the way, this subject is more dearer to me and more uh, profound to me and more important for all of us. They had to accept those who had a score of 98% from the, the girls that they were uh, planning to admit. For the boys, it was 94. But if it wasn't for the handicap of the housing or the dormitory facilities, I honestly, and we know what, we get away with 40% today. If it wasn't for that dormitory the limitation, I wouldn't be surprised that the number would have been 60%, 40%. Right. Isn't it, after all, disheartening to see women with that potential, with that insistence, with that commitment, that she is to be prevented from given an opportunity? And the answer in Saudi Arabia, no. Thank you for that very positive note about the future and making the future happen today. And on behalf of Halima and myself, it's been a great pleasure to have the opportunity to have this conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Your Royal Thank Highness. You.